Once upon a time, on the 1st of November 1955 specifically, the Vietnam conflict began. In March of 1965, America finally went full in when American combat troops officially entered the fray. The conflict raged to determine the future of Vietnam. It was a battle between the communist government in the north and the constitutional republic in the south. On the surface, it was just another battle, just another country undergoing violent change like so many other countries had undergone countless times before. But what made the conflict in Vietnam so unique was what it represented. It's true that Vietnam became the stage for the vicious rivalry between communist Russia and the United States, and the politics were clear to the onlooker. It might have seemed like yet another bloody struggle between two powerful countries, each determined to overpower the other, but it was fundamentally a battle of culture and ideas. Because isn't that what war tends to be? One culture, one set of ideas and principles asserting itself over another? Set the scene in any other country other than Vietnam, and the fight would have been over the same reasons. In other words, Remove Vietnam, and we would still leave the true battle unobscured. The question, is Comicsgate wrong, represents a similar conflict between values and ideas, with anti-Comicsgate rapidly overtaking the industry with their version of how comics should be, and then Comicsgate asserting their own set of principles in opposition. And in this scenario, Marvel has been their metaphorical Vietnam. And perhaps that fact has been a detriment to finding a clear answer behind the question. Perhaps fighting on the battleground of Marvel Comics was keeping us from exploring the real conflict and the real ideas behind them. Anti-Comicsgate's claim that exploring perceived social issues should be the dominating factor of every comic versus Comicsgate's claim that story characterization and adventure should take priority. The soapbox versus the story time chair. So let's move things to the indie sphere, where story, characters, writers, and their ideas must stand completely on their own. Two independent creators creating comics outside the mainstream. Two works constructed from the ideas of their respective artists and writers. Let's eject Marvel from the equation altogether. This final battle will take place in a metaphorical no man's land. No more brand names, no more baggage, no legacy to weigh down the creative potential of either work. Let's peel away all the pomp and circumstance, all the flashy logos, all the controversial hashtags and politically charged opinions. Let's have what we've likely needed all along. A pure, raw, naked clash of ideas. Kwanzaa Osayefo, relatively notable voice on the side of anti-Comicsgate. Richard Meyer, arguably the man who sparked Comicsgate as a movement for independent creators. The sides have been taken. The weapons have been chosen. The stage is set. Combatants to your corners. And let's get started with Black AF's America's Sweetheart by Kwanzaa Osayefo. Before getting into this comic, it should be noted that America's Sweetheart is actually a spin-off comic of Osayefo's main series black, which explores the world where only black people have superpowers. You'll see why this is important in a moment. We're introduced to Ellie Franklin, who's like totally not your hashtag typical girl, lol. Smiley face, smiley face. Why? Well, because she's adopted and has superpowers. Powers that she needs to keep secret, which comes with double the pressure since her dad has a vague and mysterious job at the White House. Ellie tells us how, despite being raised in a loving family, she still felt alone, since no one else in her life had superpowers. Then something called the Negro Muerte video dropped on the internet, revealing to the world that black people had superpowers. Suddenly, Ellie saw people all over the world show off superpowers of their own. Things seem great for Ellie until we see the political fallout. America is plagued by rampant prejudice against people with powers. The police become more aggressive and are quicker to resort to violence. And Richard Spencer is calling for government crackdown on empowered blacks. All the while, Ellie wants to help, but her dad doesn't want her getting involved, despite knowing that she's practically invincible. Then our introduction is over. Ellie suddenly has a magical metal ball that gives her a costume and then a mask. Then pow, the perfect American superhero. She's just missing one thing. There we go. Now, armed with a costume, Ellie flies off and becomes a superhero. Her good deeds start building a profile. She calls herself Good Girl. She commits one good deed after another, all while keeping her superhero activities secret from her adoptive dad. Ellie soon graduates from battling street criminals to fighting superpowered beings. Fortunately, Ellie could rival Saitama when it comes to superpowers and takes on all comers fairly easily. Unfortunately, super battles tend to be pretty noisy, so it wasn't long before a good girl gets cornered by the police. Suddenly, Ellie finds herself face to face with her dad. Then some guy pops up, but he doesn't really matter. Ellie gets a scolding, then after a short conversation with her father, decides to compromise. He lets her be a hero as long as they work together. From there, good girl's profile skyrockets. Her father helps her find missions while also doubling as her public 
relations agent. Good girl gets invited to talk shows and even gets her approval rating tracked like a presidential candidate. She starts training with the other superheroes working for the government, easily outpacing all of them, of course, and continued fighting crime and performing one good deed after another. Then things take a turn when a storm ravages a city. Good girl starts getting criticized heavily when the media notices that most everyone she's been saving recently in the storm had been minorities. They accused her of being racially prejudiced. Then apparently someone's mom had one too many Bloody Marys and goes driving down the street with her eyes closed. Ellie stops her and it turns out the lady wasn't someone's drugged out mom, but a drugged out pop star whose career Ellie just ended. Good Girl's approval rating plummets lower than Justin Trudeau and Ellie's looking at forced early retirement until a new unstoppable villain shows up. How convenient. Ellie's father sends her home where it's safe, but Ellie has other plans, especially when she notices that the villain has the same symbol on her super suit as Ellie's big metal ball. And that's when we learn that this new villain is actually Ellie's big sister. Turns out Ellie and her sister had come from a distant future when black people were enslaved. Again, the Empire used their superpowers for purposes of conquest. However, their father rebelled and sent she and Ellie back in time. And while Ellie was happy to help the world, her sister was determined to change it so that the future they came from never happened. Ellie and her sister fight while her sister pulls what I like to call the Joker Gambit, trying to convince her opponent to join you by pointing out what they're fighting for is a lie. Ellie's sister brings up all the times that people had turned against her and how Ellie is just being used. The conflict intensifies when Ellie's sister threatens to kill her quote unquote masters, which includes her father. So they fight and they fight and they fight. Then the guy pops up again from before, but he still doesn't matter and Ellie continues to fight her sister and it's clear that neither will back down from their convictions. Ellie punches her sister into the sun, which of course doesn't kill her, at least not right away. Her sister gets one more good punch in before disintegrating. Good girl saved the world, but Ellie ended up in a coma. Then that guy shows up again, but he matters so little that the moment he does, the story just decides to end. From start to finish, America's Sweetheart gave us a relatively traditional superhero story. It calls on the same themes as a Saturday morning superhero cartoon. So let's switch gears and dive into the delicious insanity of the 90s. Richard Meyer's Jawbreakers is the story of several superheroes who retired and became a mercenary group. Jawbreakers Lost Souls was the book that more or less sparked the wave of Comicsgate created books. And it also included two Jawbreakers stories. The first Jawbreakers story that launched in 2015 and Jawbreakers Lost Souls. When you open the cover, the book immediately punches you right in the face with Jawbreakers team running from their latest victory, which was apparently solving the problem by unleashing a ghostly monstrosity that thinks the Eiffel Tower looks more like a baguette, and evading the local authorities by jumping into the river, waiting a bit, and getting picked up by a star-spangled ice cream man. Next thing we know, our team has relocated to Africa, where they set up a new base of operations and get a new mission. This is where they meet Zaxi, who hires them to find and subdue a giant gorilla, which they promptly find and fight. The gorilla is eventually defeated, but two of the crew, Devil Dog and Hell Priest, were separated from the others during the fray, and then they were captured by a cyborg cowboy warlord, our main villain for the evening. This is where it's revealed that Zaxi has been an undercover agent for the evil warlord the whole time. Back with the main group, Silkworm, Cuffs, Knife Hand, and Zaxi get to loot the boss kill, and the gorilla literally bleeds gold. So a shaman shows up and informs our heroes that the gorilla was once a normal creature until he wandered into a vortex, as you do. The vortex transformed the once normal gorilla and tore the soul from his body. The creature had been wandering, looking for his soul ever since. The shaman had sort of placed himself in the role of caretaker and used his magic to absorb the gorilla's injuries. The shaman points out that Silkworm too is a wanderer in his own way, which makes him compatible for a spell. So the shaman does the voodoo that he do and mentally links Silkworm to the gorilla using the creature's blood. Meanwhile, Devil Dog and Hell Priest make their move and escape before quickly finding their way back to the others where they reveal Zaxi's secret and break her cover. Zaxi runs off. Zaxi and Cuffs had been getting close, so he lets her go. Despite everything, though, Though, the Jawbreakers crew decided to help reunite the gorilla with his soul. He bled a mountain of gold on them after all. The gorilla had been wandering because he hadn't been able to find the vortex that holds his soul. Fortunately, Hell Priest has the power to see what others can't, and that includes souls. So the shaman steps up to summon the vortex gates, but magic takes a huge toll on his body, a toll the shaman was unable to pay. By the time the vortex gates opened, the shaman had disintegrated into dust, which means they only have one last chance to set the gorilla on the right track. And that's when the warlord arrives at the gates with his entire army. Looks pretty bad for our heroes, but that's when Knife Hand shows up with his knife hands and starts slashing the warlord's army into Delimi. 
Fleet. Cuffs and Silkworm jump into battle to buy enough time for Hellpriest to find the correct portal. On the battlefield, Cuffs confronts the Warlord, who instantly takes Zaxi hostage. The Warlord offers Zaxi to Cuffs in exchange for his life. Cuffs says yes. Warlord runs away, Zaxi thinks Cuffs, and then takes off to redeem herself. Meanwhile, the gorilla is terrified by all the bullets and refuses to move. And that's when the spiritual link kicks in. Silkworm takes control and moves the giant gorilla to the middle portal, which Hellpriest has identified as the correct one. And it looks like the plan will succeed, though the warlord's army might overwhelm the Jawbreaker's team at any moment. But the gorilla takes back control of his mind, and instead of going through the portal, he turns around to help and begins attacking the warlord's army. Unfortunately, the fight takes far too long and the middle portal closes. Things look dire. But then the cavalry arrives in the shape of a stunning and brave attack helicopter and swings in Han Solo style to wipe out the warlord's entire army including the Warlord, who gets reduced to a fine red mist. The fight isn't over yet, however. The team detects enemy reinforcements, which means they need to leave, which also means that the gorilla needs to pick a portal anyway. Silkworm sends a reluctant gorilla off to wander again, and Team Jawbreakers laments on their losses, like the death of Zaxi, who has died at the hands of the Warlord, but celebrates their small victories, like being alive, and that, in the end, there is hope for all those who wander. And that ends the story of Jawbreakers' lost souls, and the stage is set. No brand names, no decades of established legacy, two sides, two different schools of thought, both open and exposed. Anti-Comics Gates belief that comics should be used as tools to commentate on politics and social issues. Comics Gates belief that comics should be used to tell stories and to entertain. So, is Comics Gate wrong? The first thing that should be taken into consideration is the fact that America's Sweetheart and Jawbreaker's Lost Souls are fundamentally different. They deliver two different kinds of promises to their respective readers. America's Sweetheart promises more more of a typical superhero story, while Jawbreakers promises us a high-octane run-and-gun expendable-style adventure with superpowers and magic. But here's the twist. I actually liked America's Sweetheart, somewhat. Yes, even the political angle, somewhat. It hits many of the points I'm looking for in a superhero story. Right from the first panel, we're introduced to the main character, Ellie Franklin. We even get a hint of her personality when we see her selfie taken with a horse. From there, the introductions flow smoothly, adding more information with each panel. We're told and then shown that she's adopted. We're shown, not told, that she has superpowers like super strength, power breath, flight, and super strong hair. We see how isolated she feels due to her powers and having to hide them. We also see that her adoptive father works in the White House, all essential elements set up from page one, an effective first page. Other than the last panel not being interesting enough to get the reader to turn the page since it's already established that she has superpowers, but that's an easy fix. There we go. Ellie also meets many of the standards I've set. She pays for her powers with her feeling of isolation, something that the readers can see is eating away at her. Why? Two reasons. Because despite having a loving home life, she felt alone. To quote, God blessed me with the best family ever, but I still felt alone. It's very human to seek out others like ourselves, to meet people who can relate to our own experiences, whether that be an occupation, a hobby, or having superpowers. And for the longest time, Ellie thought she was the only one. I always thought there was no one like me in the world. She's introduced as a two-dimensional, happy-go-lucky girl, but her internal struggle gives her a very human complexity. The second reason why her powers act as a burden to her is because, unlike Riri Williams, Ellie has an easily identifiable drive. She wants to do good, to help people, help stop the madness that erupted after the revelation of superpowers. To quote, a lot of other people weren't happy. They were scared. I just wanted to help. She's driven to produce a better world, an aspect which will become crucial later on. We're shown the chaos and violence the same way Ellie sees it. And it's easy to relate to her desire to jump in and help, except Ellie actually can. She's practically invincible, remember. She only decides not to because her parents don't want her getting involved. And although she eventually does disobey her parents, like I critiqued Kamala Khan for, unlike Kamala Khan, she does so driven by selflessness rather than selfishness. There's a bit of difference between disobeying one's parents to go to a party and disobeying one's parents to help save lives. The final confrontation with her sister Zion is written like it should be. This is where the stakes are raised sky high and why Ellie's desires, saving lives, helping her family, combat hostility by setting a good example, are put to the test, including her desire to fight for a better world, and why they become so important. Both Ellie and Zion are unimaginably powerful, but the tension of the fight doesn't come from who will beat up the other. It partly comes from the looming threat promised by Zion. It's made clear that if Ellie cannot stop Zion, everything she loves will die. But the heart of the battle is about Ellie's final choice. 
Zion reveals a powerful truth to Ellie, that Zion and Ellie are both from the future, then everything comes together. The audience can see how impactful this revelation is. The future Ellie has been fighting for will eventually end in slavery for superpowered beings. And since Zion is from that future, this isn't speculation. This is confirmed fact. The idea of a better world was essentially nothing but a product of a naive child's imagination. And remember, Zion's entrance came when Ellie's resolve was at its all-time low. The approval rating of her heroic persona had dropped into the negatives. Fake news media was smearing her. America had turned on her. The people she fought so hard for no longer wanted her. The average person would likely give in, turn their backs on everything, and join Zion. But superheroes shouldn't be average people, not when it comes to inner strength. And Ellie passes that test too, especially when she fights her sister to the death for the sake of everyone. She stayed loyal to her home, her principles, and fought a battle for which she had every indication that she would lose. Overall, Ellie's story is one of a naive young girl who was gifted with extraordinary power and used that power for good, but was tested when things changed from Smiley's Saturday morning cartoon and she was hit by the ugly reality of humanity. She learned that not every stopped crime would be rewarded. She learned that good deeds could be punished and that she would be hated for performing the wrong kind of good deeds too many times. And the final test came when Ellie was at her lowest, and then she was put lower and lower, but even then, still chose to protect the world she loved. The political angle helped give the story a bit of depth as it explored the concept of a superhero's ability to affect the community and reflect how easily people can forget old good deeds when faced with a fresh new outrage. Good Girl was treated like a politician. While Ellie was just out to help anyone in need, the bigger picture was constantly changing. It touches on a leader's potential unwillingness to act for the greater good because oftentimes it isn't what you see as right or wrong. It isn't even about saving lives or saving the world. It's about what the public sees as right and wrong. Good Girl had saved countless lives and stopped catastrophe after catastrophe, but her approval rating dropped into the negatives when she saved too many people with the wrong skin color over a short span of time and accidentally ended a white pop star's career. The whole aspect plays on the fickle gratitude of the people and presents the same question to readers that superheroes face every day. Should I continue to fight. And Ellie is eventually challenged to answer that question when all her incentives to say yes are nearly all gone. How can a hero freely do what's right when that hero must also answer to the whims of an outrage-hungry people? Is it important for a hero to be loved? Does it matter? Should it? Suddenly what's good becomes what the chosen demographic thinks is good. Suddenly what is good becomes saving only the right kinds of people or fighting only the right kinds of bad guys. These are just some of the questions America's Sweetheart brings up and does so in a character-relevant way. So, what does this mean for Comicsgate? Anti-Comicsgate produced an effective work and they did it with politics. Has Comicsgate lost? Were they wrong after all? Perhaps. But before we put the final nail in the coffin of Comicsgate, let's take a look at Jawbreaker's Lost Souls. The first page gives the reader a powerful action scene and expertly sets the stage for the oncoming story. Jawbreaker's chooses to make its initial impact with one powerful visual as opposed to the paneled summary rundown found in America's Sweetheart. Though it should be noted that both openings are fine, but both opening pages also perfectly encapsulate the principles of the respective side. Jawbreaker's first page oozes personality. From Cuff's low, powerful stature as if he's ready to ram into the next obstacle, to Knife Hand's swiping karate chop hinting at his slicing and dicing abilities, to Silkworm's outstretched arm at the head of the group signifying his leadership position, running ahead and giving us the feeling as if he's reaching out for the next adventure, even while the last crazy adventure is still finishing behind him. And let's talk about that. Even though we, as readers, have no idea what just happened, the scene opens our expectations. The giant monster they leave impaled on the Eiffel Tower opens the possibility of monsters existing in this world. Knife Hand's glowing hands show us that people with special powers also exist. In other words, page one sets the reader up with the basic elements of what the reader needs to know. That this is a world similar to our own, but far more extraordinary. Excitement, personality, wonder, humor, a promise of adventure, all are present right from page one, and the following story doesn't disappoint. Everything given to us on the first page remains consistent throughout the work, and yet, despite its simplistic premise, a group of guys having a straightforward expendable style adventure, Jawbreaker's Lost Souls adds a layer of underlying complexity with its very last 
page. The story involves a giant gorilla wandering time and space searching for his lost soul. And while the giant gorilla wasn't able to follow the right path, hope still exists that one day he might. And the last page ends with Silkworm looking down at a picture of what appears to be a long lost daughter and saying, if he can regain his lost soul, then there is hope for all who wander. So when you look back at all the events from the first page until now, you can see everything come together and connect on those two last panels. Moving from country to country at a moment's notice, fighting for money, taking on giant gorillas and cyborg warlords without a moment's hesitation, yet still showing signs of positive morality. It shows us that the Jawbreaker's crew are unattached. They're a group of aimless, directionless people constantly looking for the next big thing, the next big score with no clear endgame. They're a group of talented and powerful individuals with no ultimate destination. We're shown that the members of Jawbreaker's crew, too, are wanderers. And the question that looms over the entire story is, why do people wander? And the answer we're given by the end is because they're searching for something, something missing, something lost. We see this in Silkworm at the end. We see this with Cuff's love for Zaxi. Rather than painting Zaxi as a meaningless conquest for Cuffs, as fitting with the genre, he is shown to be deeply hurt when she dies. Cuffs was quick to latch on so strongly to Zaxi. Some might argue that this is bad writing, but it fits with the overarching theme. It shows that Cuffs, despite his confident and unshakable exterior, that he is searching for something too. Desperately searching. Searching for something Zaxi obviously provided. Some long lost fantasy that constantly eludes him. Action. Drama. Characterization comedy, excitement. Jawbreaker's Lost Soul delivers on everything Meyer promised to give, and a bit more. Jawbreaker's 2 was good. An interesting story. Just like America's Sweetheart was an interesting story. But is Comicsgate wrong? Well, let's remember each premise. Anti-Comicsgate asserts that good comics are those dense with politics and with stories that tackle relatively relevant social issues by putting story and characterization second. Comicsgate, on the other hand, claims that comics should be first and foremost most entertaining. As I stated, both stories provided something interesting and enjoyable. But here's the thing. If we take a closer look at the elements that make these stories enjoyable, one of these premises begins to break down. There are two major differences that separate Jawbreaker's Lost Souls from America's Sweetheart. And I mean beyond differences in subgenre, even beyond story and characterization. While Jawbreaker's Lost Souls chose to abstain from politics, America's Sweetheart stands as an interesting example on both writing politics correctly and how to use politics incorrectly. Osayefo's use of politics was executed well when it remained as a kind of critique on politics itself. When Good Girl was leashed to an approval rating, there are no sides being pushed. This bit of politics isn't centered on one particular issue. It isn't about race or gender or sexuality. It isn't about right wing or left. It was just a pure commentary, biting into the basis of a system ruled by popularity. And more importantly, this little factor plays a big role in both Ellie's career career as a superhero and changing her mindset leading up to the final confrontation. The approval rating was key to shattering Ellie's sense of romanticism about being a hero. It allowed the tension of the final confrontation to exist at all. Unfortunately, that's only a part of the politics Osoyefo decided to use in the construction of this story. While interesting political commentary is present, it's far overshadowed by the forced inclusion of biased racial politics. The story begins with Ellie being adopted by a white family. When she ends up working for her father in the White House as a superhero, her once loving relationship between father and daughter seems to degrade into less of a parent and child and more akin to an agent and client, or master and slave. Love and warmth seem to vanish between Ellie and her father, and suddenly he's setting Good Girl up for missions and interviews. Suddenly he seems to care more about the benefits she can provide rather than worrying about Ellie herself. The public begins to turn on Ellie when she starts saving too many black people, refocusing the story from a young optimistic girl's journey into superheroism into a commentary on racial prejudice. And remember, the public supposedly turned on Good Girl because when she started saving all those brown and black people, it was following a terrible hurricane that struck an area densely populated by black people. Let me say that again. Osayefo is telling us that the majority of the American population began hating Ellie because she was helping survivors in the aftermath of a natural disaster because they were black. It's too extreme. Not only can most people see with their own eyes that we tend to band together during natural disasters, Disasters, but even sites like the Huffington Post and the Scientific American have written articles on why natural disasters bring people together so strongly, not tear them apart. If anything, Ellie would have been universally praised for her work, not condemned. This calls to a common NPC assertion and presumed general assumption that America is highly in 
intolerant and racist, that its people put hatred and bigotry even above common sense or their own self-interest. This is emphasized when Ellie accidentally injuring a drunk white woman was a death blow to her career. A 2013 Washington Post article asked people around the world who would they not want as neighbors. The article recorded the number of people who responded people of another race, meaning they covered how many people in each country would hate living next to someone of a different race. America fell into the 0 to 4.9 percent category. Even in 2018, when America's own press had constantly tried to smear their own country as irredeemably bigoted and intolerant, findings released by The Guardian, yes, that Guardian, found that America only competes with Canada as being the most accepting, tolerant, and inclusive country in the world to immigrant citizens. To quote a 2018 article published by the National Review, by no plausible objective standard is America the most racist or bigoted country in the world, even just among industrialized countries. On a 2014 list of countries ranked by opposition to having a racially different neighbor, America ranked 47th, with 6% of the population saying they were opposed. In raw numbers, we admit more immigrants than any other country. And as Amy Chua notes in her new book, Political Tribes, no other major power in the world has ever democratically elected a racial minority as head of state. In other words, the political commentary strays away from an interesting critique on the nature of humanity to a frankly masturbatory victimhood fantasy. You can feel the bitterness and hatred coming from these scenarios. It becomes biased, preachy, incredibly heavy-handed. It's kind of like that family guy joke where a guy would pop up as a subliminal message and just order you to smoke. When it comes to the racial politics, Osayefo displays the same comedic bluntness and exaggeration, but plays it seriously. And this is all skimming over the fact that Ellie and the other superpowered black people who work for the government are literally part of an organization labeled House, a not-so-subtle connection to the obedient house slaves, rather overtly signifying that Ellie isn't free, that she's nothing but a slave, nothing but a tool for her white family. Story-wise, this all comes to a climax when the dreaded future Ellie and her sister had come from is not simply a tyrannical warlike dystopia, but an era when white people had re-enslaved black people somehow. Because if you recall, in this world, only black people have superpowers. And doesn't that premise give you an eerie yet familiar feeling? Like we've seen this exact mindset before, except a little different. Oh. Right. And what's even worse, these politics are more heavily stuffed into the parts I chose not to cover because they, at best, add nothing and at worst, actually hurt the story. To summarize, everything I liked about America's Sweetheart, including some of the politics, came from an interesting story, fitting characterization, and political commentary that critiqued our real-life political systems and general human behavior. But unfortunately, the entire work was held down considerably by preachy biased social commentary. All the parts anti-comics gate said should come first. However, poisonous politics is only the second biggest tragedy of America's sweetheart. But the biggest isn't something present within the story, it's something absent. One crucial thing Jawbreaker's Lost Souls clearly has, but Osayefo's work does not passion. Oh, it's obvious Osayefo is passionate about something. It just isn't the story or characters. Because America's Sweetheart is an interesting story, and it's probably because the core of its plot was carefully constructed by someone else, just before they made that plot into a movie, Man of Steel. A movie from which Osayefo stole the plot and promptly cut it with politics. At its base, every major development is the same. Adopted orphan being raised by a loving family with wholesome morals, a strong sense of isolation, the father figure who doesn't want their superpowered orphan using their superpowers for their own sakes. Orphan becomes superhero, helps people, public opinion turns against them, orphan finds a connection to their origins, connection threatens to destroy the world, orphan is forced to choose between building a brighter future for their people or saving the people they love. Orphan ultimately chooses to defend loved ones by killing the last link to their origin. There are a few differences, certainly, but there's also a difference between being inspired and an outright ripoff. Let's compare this to Meyer's Jawbreakers Lost Souls. Jawbreakers has been criticized for being nothing but a G.I. Joe ripoff. But that isn't the case. As mentioned, America's Sweetheart was nothing but a refurbished Man of Steel, watered down with heavy-handed politics. Now, let's take a look at Meyer's work. Jawbreakers is part G.I. Joe, part Expendables, part King Kong, part Rambo, and part Jackie Chan movie. Let me put it like this. When creating America's Sweetheart, the creators said, let's just do Man of Steel, but reshape it to fit our agenda. When creating Jawbreakers Lost Souls, Meyer said, what would happen if you combined a super-powered Expendables team, King Kong, a super-powered Rambo villain, and humorous 
humorous fight scenes with funny dialogue. See the difference? One just does the old copy and paste, while the other takes pieces from several different sources to create something entirely new. And that difference is the defining reason why it's clear that Osayefo's work lacks passion, while Meyer's work is filled with it. I mean, what would you think of someone who copies tests to get by? Osayefo's work lacks passion, and in its place lies nothing but bitterness and lazy writing. No care went into America's sweetheart. It's clear that the creators just needed a pre-packaged vessel to strap their agenda onto. Meyer's work is The Expendables. It's G.I. Joe. It's King Kong and Jackie Chan. And it's also none of those things. Jawbreakers has several clear inspirations, but Meyer took those inspirations and created something with its own unique identity. It's easy to take a story, gut it, and slap on your own stuff. It takes work to build something all your own. Meyer put in that work. It has its own world, its own rules, its own themes, its own characters, and their own backgrounds and personalities. So that when you pick up Jawbreakers, you weren't picking up a G.I. Joe story. You're not picking up King Kong or The Expendables. You're picking up Jawbreakers, and you're about to read a Jawbreakers story. Because despite everything, setting aside all the dramatic moments, all the betrayals, lies, twists, turns, romances, great heroes, vile villains, and sappy happy endings, remember that one's creative big bang begins long before you write a single word. Because the heart and soul of creation tends to begin with wonder and excitement as the littlest spark of a child's imagination. When I used to leave the theater after seeing an Errol Flynn movie, I'd be about 12 years old, I don't know, I'd walk down the street with a crooked little grin on my face, thinking it was the way he grinned. And I had an imaginary sword at my side. And I'd be looking around, hoping to see some bully picking on a little girl so I could defend her. It seems that along the way, the once great comic book industry became so fixed on writing moral stories that they forgot what it took to write a good one. A good comic book story has what any good adventure story has, except it's illustrated, that's all. But it's, it has to have all the elements. Good characterization, believable dialogue, and exciting situations. In a world filled with so much hostility, it seems we've forgotten where the comics community had come from. The big heart that helped create it and the great man who shared that heart with all of us. How his passion brought so many people from so many backgrounds, from so many different walks of life together. I try to inject a feeling of warmth in all the books. Occasionally they'd run a letters page and it would be like this. Dear editor, I read your story and I liked it. Signed, Charles Smith. And the answer would be, Dear Charles, thank you very much, the editor. Well, I decided to run letters pages, but I wanted to make them friendly. I wanted the kids to feel a part of Marvel. So even if somebody wrote a letter that said, Dear editor to me, when I printed it, I wrote, Dear Stan. I changed the word editor to Stan. And when I answered the letter, instead of saying, Dear Charles, I'd say something like, Hey, thanks a lot, Charlie. You know, and I tried to keep the tone friendly, as if I'm a guy they know and we're just talking together. And after a while, it became very natural. And after a while, all the letters, Hey, Stan, I loved your story. Hey, Stan, I hated your story. Whatever it was, but... It was like they knew me and I knew them. It's easy to forget that comics were never really about politics, that most great comics just wanted to make the world better. I never, I don't like to preach. I hate people to preach to me and I don't like to preach to other people. But at the same time, I feel there are kind of universal truths that nobody could quibble with. Like, to me, the most important mantra in the world is do unto others what you'd have them do unto you. I mean, I don't see how anybody could take issue with that, and I try to follow that, and I think if everybody followed it, this would be a, the world would be paradise. And so it comes down to this, the question that's not only important for one single movement, but for everyone. So, for the final time, riddle me this, is Comics Gate wrong? My, 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 all this talk about comics has been rather inspiring. As promised at the beginning, I will be revealing two announcements. 
The first is that I've made a dedicated livestream channel called The First Edition, where I talk about topics relating to writing, movies, TV shows, and other delicious gems of modern pop culture. New episodes typically come out on Friday nights at 8pm central. If you're interested, a link to the channel will be in the description. And the second announcement? Well, I have decided to switch gears from being a consumer of comics to try my hand at creating one. Set in the superhero genre, of course, or in this case, the supervillain genre. Dr. Alpha is one of the most dangerous supervillains in the universe. Here's what much you get if Tyler Durden became a mad scientist and added just a pinch of Joker. The art is done by the very talented J. Paul Sheik. A link to his website will also be in the description if you want to check out his other work. I've taken heavy inspiration from the pulps, which means I've made sure the story is fast-paced and packed with twists, turns, and plenty of drama. I kind of wanted to explore what might happen if I took a world set in the Golden Age, where villains pull schemes like turning rivers into jello and heroes make witty puns after capturing bad guys and then tossing in the Dark Knight's Joker. Like watching the Super Friends face off against Jigsaw. And yes, there are plot reasons for this. In the first story, Dr. Alpha Miracle Child, Alpha has already committed decades of supervillainy, but his story takes place during a pivotal moment in his career, and it kicked off when his arch enemy, the superhero known as Glorious, came to visit him in the lowest level of Icarus Prison, a Guantanamo for supervillains, and reveals a secret that instantly changes the direction of Alpha's life. A secret so powerful, it will be the one factor that drives the entire series, should it succeed. But there isn't much time to think as the world is placed under the gun of a massive alien invasion led by Mulvion, the Martian mastermind. After all, who better to unite Glorious with his arch enemy Dr. Alpha than a villain who was once thought dead and nearly conquered the world? Dr. Alpha is a series that will explore the world of supervillainy. A look at the other side. No modern day politics, no addressing Trump, and no NPC nonsense. Just a plot driven drama with aliens, super battles, and a character who's nothing less than deliciously toxic. The project isn't currently ready for launch on Indiegogo, but it's being worked on and I'll make another announcement when it finally officially launches. In the meantime, keep an eye on the first edition channel. I'll be setting up a Dr. Alpha Q&A stream there shortly. And that's it. That's all for the announcements. Thank you very much for watching.